Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have with us Mike Rinder. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Nice to be back. Mike, I'm glad to have you back. I wanted to ask you about Sylvia Stenard's appearance at Chautauqua last week that Tony Ortega featured. Mm -hmm. What was your overall impression of her as a PR spokesman? Well, Jeff, I, I got to say, honestly, I think she's probably about the best they've got in that she is relatively articulate and uh, makes a fairly good presentation and speaks pretty clearly. But what, what's so strange is to watch the, the, you know, struggling spokesperson trying to respond to questions that are... Uh, uh, she is precluded from doing giving anything other than the party line, and so you you see very strange <laughs> responses and reactions. Although clearly she's not the first person that's had to respond in that fashion. I mean, I did it when I was the spokesperson. Tommy Davis did it. Heba did it. But it, it's becoming um, so. Uh, ridiculous at this point, you know, when, when she gets asked about Xenu and then starts going off into some notes, a thing, you know, really non sequitur thing about, oh, well, it's some notes from some people's counseling sessions and then people have taken those, these unpublished notes and turned them into what Scientologists believe. That's, that's anybody that has access to the internet can go look at L. Ron Hubbard's handwriting, the documents in his own hand, and she's standing there trying to say, well, it's just some unpublished notes of somebody or other. And, and similarly, you hear the same responses about suppressive persons and disconnection. Oh, no, it's just your choice. Uh, everybody has a choice, and she keeps talking about, well, it's, it's like if you have a, an abusive husband and, you know, you want to leave the relationship. Well, that wasn't actually the question that she was asked. And she constantly changed the question that she was asked to give the response that she's supposed to give. And, you know, she doesn't really have any choice in the matter. That's all she can do. She did, she's not free to honestly respond. She's only free to present the position of the church. Mike, that's uh, that basically says it all. And and what I saw was a, a you know a Scientology official struggling between two worlds: the Scientology world, that is the inside of the Church of Scientology, and the actual world out here. She's caught in between two worlds, trying to communicate, and it's an impossible job. For example, uh, an older lady asked Sylvia very politely about disconnection. Sylvia immediately answers by saying, the Tampa Bay Times has really singled us out for attack. <laughs> that way, you're not answering the question. After she invalidates the Tampa Bay Times, she says, you know, if you were a woman and your husband beat you, you would divorce him and not really want to see him. Well, no, that again is, that's again evasive. It's a bait and switch. We're talking about you disconnecting from people, Sylvia. You're your church. We're not talking about a woman who's abused. Right. And and that's what I said. Everything gets turned into the question that they want to be responding to, not the question that they were actually asked. I mean, there were so many examples in there, Jeff. It was like, it was just like watching <laughs> one train wreck after another. I mean, she went on about, you know, L. Ron Hubbard is not a god, he's just a man. Well, you know, there was a pretty interesting article that uh, Marty had on his blog recently about, and taking the quotes from L. Ron Hubbard saying, you know, I'm not from this planet. I w I'm here to save you. Well, that was what the person was actually asking about, but she didn't respond to that. You know, then then someone asked her about, well, tell us about the the scientific experiments and and evidence, and she cited mission into time, <laughs> which is just hilarious. I mean, mission into, yeah. mission into time was a was a complete and utter failure. 
<laughs> now, tell our listeners about what Mission into Time was. There's a lot of people who were never in who don't know about it. Can you tell us about this? This was a, an early project of the Sea Organization where L. Ron Hubbard said he had recalled various places in earlier lives where he had buried hidden treasure. And so he sent these people off uh, to locate where the hidden treasure was. But they didn't locate any of it. And there was no, no hidden treasure found whatsoever. They claimed that they found ruins that nobody knew about. Well, maybe they didn't know about them, but I'm sure other people did. It, it, it was turned into a, a, quote, test of whole track recall, unquote. But the truth of the matter is it didn't prove anything one way or the other. What, what's so disingenuous about the way that the, that the church responds to these questions is they don't want to actually live up to what they believe in. <laughs> and so everything is changed. Like she gets asked questions about psychiatry and she mealy mouths around about, well, we're just opposed to mind-altering drugs and I don't like... I don't like uh, electric shock treatment. Well, nobody likes electric shock treatment. But the truth of the matter is the church is absolutely opposed to all psychiatry, everything about it. There is a campaign that is announced every year. I did some when I was still in at the IAS event on the, the utter destruction of psychiatry, the obliteration, the demolition, every word that you can imagine. And it's not discriminating. It's just everything. And she knows, she has read the Pain and Sex HCOB, which says the psychiatrists are the source of all evil on planet Earth, and they have been since on the whole track. Maybe she hasn't read the Farsec advice, but she's definitely read those HCOBs that were written, the last, really the last HCOBs that L. Ron Hubbard wrote, that rail against all psychiatrists and claim that they're, they're the evil of, of the world. Well, why doesn't she just say that? If that really is what Scientologists believe, and it is, then why not say it? If Incident 2 and Xenu and everything really is, what, what's so wrong with saying it? It's been proved, even though the justification has always been, well, if you talk about that, it harms people or potentially harms them and can make them sick and die and this and that. Look, that stuff's been on the Internet now for like 10 years, and there's not one reported incident of anybody dying from reading it. There are tens of thousands. There's more people outside of Scientology that have read it than there are inside of Scientology that's read it. And not a single one of them has anything ever happened to, except probably they got a good laugh out of it. Now, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong that, you know, OT3 is or isn't true or not true. But why not just fess up to it now at this point? It's not more bizarre than what the Mormons believe and that Joseph Smith had golden plates fall out of the sky from some archangel that laid out what, what the beliefs of the, the, the Mormon church is. I mean, it's not more unbelievable than Jesus Christ rising from the dead. It's not, every religion has got stuff that other people find unbelievable. But she said one thing that was true, and it was an offhanded comment. She said, that's why we're a religion. And that is what religion is. It's faith. It is absolutely faith, and, and you raise several interesting points. First, any religion inherently deals with supernaturalism. You have supernatural claims. That cannot be scientifically proven. You, you can't prove, uh, for example, that Jesus rose from the dead, nor do you have to as a Christian. It's a faith affirmation. Right. And to say, to talk about Zeno or Incident 2 of OT3, this is a subjectively held belief that a Scientologist, and I have actually talked to, to OTs who said, look, did that happen? I don't care. I find that I got case gain out of doing the OT levels. Right. I've had OTs uh, say to me, well, that was on Ron's case. Or if it did happen, it didn't come up for me in session. Christians unashamedly, very unashamedly preach that Jesus Christ died for their sins. 
Christians have no problem telling you two things. Jesus died for your sins, too. If you don't accept him, you're going to go to hell. People, meaning culture, understands that's the Christian argument, and they accept or reject it, right? Now, why is talking about Jesus dying for your sins and you're going to hell, why is it any different than Scientologists saying, look, this really happened in history. Incident 2 really happened, and Sylvia Stenar should talk about it. This is really the problem. She can't do it. Do you think when the church argues that it's a trade secret, the OT levels are a trade secret, they're wanting the best of both worlds? That is, they don't want to tell you what it is, but they want to hook you into it? <laughs> I mean, is that, really what go is that really what is going on? Because you're right. The Zenu story is no different than what's in Mormonism, Christianity, Hinduism, or anything else. Right. And as to the, the motive behind it, I, I don't know that I know the answer to that, Jeff. I, it, I, they could be, there could be different motives, and there could be motives that have changed over time. You know, I don't doubt, like, if you listen to RJ67 and, and read the stuff that L. Ron Hubbard wrote about what was going on at that time in OT3, I think that he was sincere. I think he really believed it. And he didn't have a problem telling people that he believed it. But now the church can't tell people that they believe it. <laughs> I mean, that's what's, <laughs> that's what's sort of so bizarre. And everything that she talks about, she would, and the church would be better off, in my opinion, standing up and saying, look, this is what we believe in. She even gets asked about Clea by the guy that says he's a Scientologist. And she gives this horribly mealy-mouthed description of what a Clea is, or someone that's doing better in life and blah, 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 and go read Dianetics. Well, if you go read Dianetics, it doesn't say someone who's doing better in life and, and her mealy-mouthed description. It says someone that has, isn't going to get a cold, has perfect recall, blah, 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 blah. All of the claims that are made about Clea. Then... Why not just say that? Why not say what it really is? Because, and the reason is because they're afraid that if they actually say what is the isness, that people won't accept them. Well, then that just means it's a bait and switch. Saying something different than what we really are in order to not offend you so that we can get you on our side or inside the church and then will disclose to you what's really going on. When she says she's not familiar with the toothbrush thing, that's the most ridiculous thing. She's obviously read the St. Pete Times. She obviously is, has, is familiar with a lot of people who have claimed that they have had to clean out dumpsters with toothbrushes. And she says, well, I'm not familiar with that. You know, just a few ex-members have complaints. These things are like, look, if the RPF and people wearing black boiler suits, if the RPF is what it is, why not just say, we have a program. It's tough. It's nasty. It's one thing that Tommy Davis actually did that I thought was the correct thing to do. And just say, front up on some of this stuff and say, yeah, we're, we're tough sons of bitches. Too bad. That's how, that's how we are. Like it or don't like it. Tough. And I think that that's sort of... You know, I don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I thought Tommy Davis did a good job. He he did and said some absolutely stupid things. But on the other hand, just standing up and saying, "Look, this is what we believe in, and this is what we do, and this is how we are," is probably more of if they think that they're persuading people by giving the mealy mouth version. They're not, because what everybody does, they go look on the internet and they go, oh, they're just a bunch of lying assholes. They don't, they're not looking at it and going, oh, yeah, that sounds really good. They're going, uh, sounds like an evasive answer. Oh, sounds like bullshit. Oh, sounds like uh, just a lie. And then they go look it up and they find out, oh, yeah, it's just a lie. Why does the church continue to keep lying? Is it just doctrinally committed to doing what Sylvia's doing? I mean, is it stuck? I, I think so. I mean, it's it's stuck in a lot of ways. You know, uh, what is acceptable or unacceptable is, you know, pretty clearly delineated from the top. And, you know, Ms. Miscavige would never countenance anybody saying that, you know, uh, 
we we condone disconnection, for example, because he's afraid that it will, well, first of all, show how many lies have been told. <laughs> See, you, this is the problem. When you tell those sort of lies and you keep telling them, you can never go back because then someone is going to come along and say, wait a minute. You, so you mean you lied here and 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 here and here and here. So they're sort of stuck because they've been telling lies for a long time and they can't ever now say, oh no, that wasn't true because someone's going to stick it up their butt and say, well, how come you've been saying for 25 years that this isn't the way it is and now you say, oh yes, it is. Well, where does that leave them? I mean, does DM... <laughs> where does, does it leave them? <laughs> it leaves yeah, them but... looking like fools constantly. I don't know. I mean... It, my, like I said, I, I, you know, I sort of have empathy for Sylvia Stana because she doesn't really have an option about what she can answer. She has to try and maintain the party line. She's like a North Korean PR spokesperson. Oh yeah, everything's wonderful in the in the People's Republic of North Korea. We're doing great. Look, all the people are happy. Everybody's got you know clothes, and we don't have. It, it's just. BS, and the more time goes on, and the more there is on the internet, and the more media coverage there is, and the more people that walk out and say, okay, this is what was really going on, the, the more apparent the lies are. What do you think it feels like for people who are still on the inside watching all this play out? Because they're not idiots. Uh, that's, that's such a good question, Jeff. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I can't. I mean, it's such a long thing to try and describe or explain uh, why people stay where they are or, or keep thinking like they think. But, you know, one of the things that you just, you just said just sort of prompted me to make an observation about this. The only thing that, that they can do to attempt to... Uh, at least balance out the bad PR because they can't really own up and say, well, this is what's really going on and here's how, how things are and uh, for the reasons that we've discussed. But all they can do is kind of turn around and go, yes, but you don't really understand. You don't have the, the full picture. And to prove that, look at how we're expanding. Do you think we'd be expanding like this if we really were all bad? Of course we wouldn't. Nobody would come near us. So that's part of the reason why this almost manic effort to keep showing that they're expanding and why Sylvia Stanner will stand there and say, well, you know, we've got more than 11,000 churches, missions, and groups around the world in 167 countries and blah, 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 blah. She knows that's not true, but that's the party line. And it's the only line that they can come up with that in some fashion responds to or deals with this constant barrage of you people are a bunch of unlikable, nasty, lying cult that is trying to control people's lives and breaks up families, etc., etc. And they can't actually respond, so they have to try and give the other impression. Oh no, but that's not that can't be the whole picture because look, we're expanding. Do you think people would would be continuing to come into the church if they if that was what was really going on? That's the sort of implied message of the entire campaign to convince people that everything is hunky-dory and the ideologues are just terrific and we've got massive international expansion at unprecedented levels happening like no time in history. Mike, and that's backed up. I'm glad you said that. That is backed up by a letter that David Miscavige's attorney, Jeffrey K. Riffer, sent to Graydon Carter of Vanity Fair. Mm -hmm. This was a letter uh, Mr. Riffer sent threatening Vanity Fair, Murray North, and Graydon Carter if they published defamatory details about David Miscavige, right? Mm -hmm. he, he puts in there, I believe it's 26 different new ideal orgs that have opened. Yep. My thinking when I was reading Mr. Riffer's letter, well, wait a minute, that's a non sequitur. Because you have 26 new buildings doesn't prove that David Miscavige is anything 
doesn't prove that he didn't, you know, look for a wife for Tom Cruise, beat his staff or anything else. The, the two things are unrelated. The real estate portfolio is a comment only on your income. And what the church is not telling us about its ideal orgs, is this real estate performing? Or, or, is, there, or is this just, you know, a non-performing real estate portfolio? But you're right, they do keep trying to shove down ideal orgs down the public's throat as if you have to accept our arguments that our purchase of new buildings means we're expanding because we're like, I guess, what, Starbucks? Starbucks during a period was also expanding. If you remember before 2008, it was opening a, a lot of stores all the time. So maybe they're engaging in the Starbucks argument that uh, real estate expansion is proof of growth. Well, of course they are. And, but that, I mean, that's the only thing that they can claim. <laughs> That's what I'm saying is that this sort of – you said, well, what do you do? And there isn't really a, a, a good thing to do. There's no uh, expedient solution to the problem of having lied for so long that you, now you're, you're stuck with your lies. So instead of talking about the lies, they try and uh, deflect every conversation into and look at our wonderful expansion and the, the – the the message that goes along with look at our wonderful expansion is and we wouldn't be expanding like this obviously if we were doing all these things that people are saying we're doing when you were talking when you were in the church as the international pr spokesman you had to have been under intense pressure you're talking to john sweeney denying certain things yep how many levels of threat? What did you feel being in that position? What does it feel like? Give our listeners a sense of what it feels like to be under that pressure. Well, that's why I said that I, I you know, I feel some empathy for, for Sylvia Stannard. She's in, in an impossible position, just like anybody else who's ever been a spokesperson for the churches, because you are confronted with, I must say X but it's an inappropriate or untrue response to what you're being asked. And if you respond honestly and, and perhaps uh, even accomplish something by doing so, you're going to get uh, annihilated for having violated what, whatever it is that you weren't supposed to have said and whatever the reason was that you weren't supposed to say it. And it, it's, it's like being uh, literally between a rock and a hard place. It's, it's just there's no good solution to it. There's nothing that you can do that is right both in the eyes of the church or and, and in the eyes of the public who are hearing it. It's, it's impossible. You can't do both. So... Because your family, your existence, your uh, well-being generally is tied to the church, you end up doing and saying what the church wants in order to keep the church people bosses happy. Not necessarily what really is true or what is, a, is actually an honest answer to the question. And so Sylvia is standing there, and what the Church of Scientology can't do, it's at a religious conclave, a symposium. It can't engage in a meaningful dialogue about anything with culture. Right. And that's its problem, is that a meaningful dialogue doesn't, they're confused on words. PR is not a meaningful and honest dialogue. There are very devout and sincere Christians who will talk to you about the meaning of Jesus rising from the dead, what the resurrection means, what the incarnation, life, and death of Christ means. There are very devout Muslims who will tell you why Islam is true monotheism and the other faiths are not. So they'll speak honestly. And Mike, one thing I've noticed the Church of Scientology doesn't have, it doesn't have what's called apologetic. Now that's a Latin word meaning to make a defense of one's faith. Right. There are no apologetics in Scientology. To me, that's always been a huge outpoint, to use the Scientology word. Christians, Jews, Hindus, 
Muslims have apologetics. They can make a defense of the faith from reasoned argument. You might not agree with them, but at least they'll use Plato, Socrates, the church fathers, etc., to make a defense of the faith. Because of the OT levels and the secrecy surrounding them for all kinds of reasons, they're not able to offer an apologetical dis uh, perspective of their faith. Mike, one of the ironies of the Church of Scientology is that they have to use non-Scientology religious scholars to make the case for Scientology on their behalf. Right. One of the ironies of the Church of Scientology is they have to use non-Scientology attorneys to defend them in court. And more and more, David Miscavige has even outsourced construction of all these ideal orgs to non-Scientology construction firms, design firms. So it seems to me, Mike Rinder, that more and more the Church of Scientology is all about outsiders helping. They're hiring WOGs to defend the church. They're <laughs> hiring non-Scientologist religious scholars, non-Scientology lawyers, non-Scientology this, PIs, investigators. It's almost as if you have to have a huge protective bubble made out of non-Scientology professionals to defend the people that are still in, to somehow keep them in. And for the people that are in, you have a harsh internal justice system. At some point, this doesn't seem to be very sane. <laughs> Jeff, the master of understatement. <laughs> yeah, it's like... I, ha I have asked Karen, the Church of Scientology wants to solve war, crime, and insanity, and I've told Karen, you can't do that when you're at war, when you're engaging in criminality and you're insane. The very things it wants to cure are the very things it's being on an active basis. And I've had journalists ask me the same question they've asked you. What happens if today David Miscavige went to the giant implanting station in the sky? He kicks the bucket, drops the body, call it what you will, right? What happens? I, and I say, nothing happens. It's the system. You don't understand the system will not allow any changes. Right. Is that, do you agree with that statement? Um, I do, although I think that, also, that, that that's modified somewhat by the idea that while the system won't allow any changes, you still have to have someone that's running the show and making that system operate. And I don't believe that there is anybody that's capable of doing that in his absence, and it would just devolve into uh, a complete circus of nobody knows which way is up, nobody knows what they're supposed to or not supposed to be doing, and it will, it will you know, disappear up its own asshole. Because there is a lot of lunatic things that get done by Miscavige it, it's like, well, at least the trains run on time. <laughs> this is, this is, you know what I mean? It's like the, yeah. the Mussolini in Italy. I mean, uh, and people look back, some people <laughs> look back fondly <laughs> at, well, at least the trains ran on time. Yeah, the guy was a, a complete lunatic, sociopath, suppressed person in every sense of the word, but the very fact that that control and order was exerted does create some stability. And I believe that in his absence, that stability will quickly vanish, or what stability there is will quickly vanish, and you will see the thing just implode faster than, you know, you know the Death Star on Star Wars. Sure, and if I, if I may think like O.T., my alter ego, OT8, is great. Yeah. We could hire Monique Yingling as a WOG to run the church as an administrator. <laughs> we already have all these non-Scientologists running things. We might as well just hire her and let her run it because at least, you know, she's a lawyer, right? There's no good answer to what happens when Miscavige's reign is over. Uh, it's very instructive to look at uh, to look at other groups, other cults, what I've written and said is that cults end badly, and I don't think it's any different for the Church of Scientology. I think it ends badly. And it's already in the middle of things ending badly. Uh, do you think Miscavige has lost effective control of the publics? No, I don't. No? Do you think, do you think, because I'm looking at the South African blog. I'm watching that as a barometer. Do you think that's a localized situation? Miscavige still has good control of his publics? Uh, you said... Lost control versus good control. No, I don't no, think I'm, the good control uh, exists any longer, but I don't think that he has lost control. I think that people still listen to him and look up to 
uh, anything that he says, and you, you see plenty of evidence around that, you know, the word of David Miscavige is, is pretty close to the word of L. Ron Hubbard in the minds of Scientologists, and that means infallible. That means, you know, I, I've got the Pope beat in a, in a TKO because I'm actually, you know, I got corrected on my blog by saying, you know, Catholics believe that the Pope is infallible. And I, a bunch of Catholics came out and said, no, 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 that's not true. Papal infallibility isn't actually the case anymore, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, I, I believe that Miscavige has got that still at this point better than the Pope's got it. He is infallible in the minds of the vast majority of Scientologists. He can if he says something, it becomes true simply because he said it. That's all that is necessary. Is there's no proof necessary. There is no explanation, justification. It's simply he said it. So, therefore, it's true. And that's a pretty good state of affairs to be in if you're trying to run a cult or be a dictator or, you know, uh, control the lives of a bunch of uh, of random people that are around you, and I don't think that he has completely lost that ability to be able to dictate to Scientologists, this is what you should and shouldn't think, because there's plenty of evidence, Jeff, that they still do. I hadn't thought about it that way, but in the, I think it was 1993, David Miscavige's last interview with the St. Pete Times, yeah. he told them that he thought power was, you know, when people were willing to listen to you. Right. That's an interesting view of power. People are willing to listen to you. I don't know if that's a good uh, if that's a good definition of power, but it's certainly a religious defini definition of power. Now, it's not that people will listen to him. It's that he has rather the infallibility bestowed upon him by RTC, and and evidently in the minds of Scientologists by L. Ron Hubbard. Right. So as long as he speaks ex cathedra his words are infallible, then people will continue to ride the church as it, as it implodes. And I think it's cratering and has been since about 2005. I applaud you for the work you're doing on your blog. I read it every day. It's a wealth of detail. It really gives you a, a, a look into the state, of the state of mind of the current church. And the way it's drifting off, it's almost becoming cartoonish, especially with the <laughs> fundraisers. I agree, Jeff. It seems like the, the fundraising has devolved into a parody, a farce, a joke. Yep. And I got to tell you a really funny thing that happened on my OT at his great blog. One day the church did something really outlandish. It was really stupid and silly. And I, I don't recall what, but it was, just, it was just a gimme. It just was parody handed to me on a silver platter. So I had OT at his great parody, right? And then one of the commenters, in one of the funniest comments ever, said, some days they make your job too easy. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God, they do. As a satirist, you know, I look for the humor in things, right? I look at places to satirize the church. And i got to tell you, Mike, and you and I probably share this guilty pleasure. Some days, when, when it's funny, they make our job too easy. <laughs> I agree with you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and Tony Ortega shows that every Sunday on his Sunday funnies. Right. Now, if I'm shelling out hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to OT, to me it's not funny at all. It becomes kind of tragic. It's something I'm mad about. The SP's joking and degrading. So I guess I'll end it at this. Church of Scientology, if you want to be taken seriously, you have to act like a church. You can't act like a joke. You can't act like a fascist. You can't act like a criminal. And Mike, quite frankly, I don't think they're going to make it. I don't, I don't think they're brief breath in eternity. I don't think they make it. I, but that's just me. Well, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Jeff. And we'll leave it at that. I do so appreciate you coming on the show. Mike, you were uh, my first guest. You helped me launch my channel. So I, I very much appreciate it. Wish the best for you and your family and your continuing efforts on your blog because it is a great it's a great blog. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine. We're available online at survivingscientologyradio.com, on iTunes where we leave the search category Scientology, and on YouTube at Surviving Scientology. As always, we'll be in very good touch. Thank you for.